Hi everyone, welcome to Wild Washington Live at Moran State Park. I'm super excited for this event. We've partnered uh, with Washington State Parks and Washington Service Corps to bring you this incredible event. Uh, my name is Leah Althauser and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And before we, we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining you from the traditional and ancestral lands of the Nisqually peoples, who have been caretakers of this land since time immemorial. <clears throat> to learn more about the Nisqually tribe and their culture and how they've taken care of the land, please see the link in the chat. This program is part of our Wild Washington education program. Wild Washington offers uh, science standards, uh, aligned lessons and other events um, for fish, wildlife, and natural resources. And what's really neat is that these lessons, we have one lesson for third through fifth graders on temperate rainforest ecosystems, and then we have another lesson for third through fifth graders on coastal ecosystems. And you can find those lessons at the link in the chat. We have enabled closed captioning, but if you would like to turn it off, please click the button with the two C's in the lower right-hand corner of your toolbar and you'll see the option for turning off the subtitles. We won't be taking verbal questions, so raised hands will not be called on, um, but if you do have a question, our uh, guest presenters will be able to answer it. Please put that question in the Q&A feature. We won't be using chat. I'm super excited to introduce our two presenters today. We have uh, Deanna Bugal and Rachel Baker from Washington State Parks. And they are at Moran State Park and Obstruction Pass State Park right now and really excited to talk to you. And so Deanna, I'm gonna send it over to you. Hi, thanks Leah. Um, before I begin today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that here in Moran, I am on the occupied territory of the Coast Salish peoples, primarily the Lummi people who have been stewards of this land for generations. As Leah said, my name is Deanna, my, I use she, her pronouns, and I am one of our AmeriCorps interpretive naturalists here at Moran State Park. As an interpretive naturalist, my job here at the park is to enhance a visitor's experience, whether it's answering questions or telling stories about our park here. Additionally, Moran is celebrating our 100 year anniversary, our centennial as a state park. All the way back a century ago, Robert Moran donated a portion of his land to Washington State and continued to make donations until eventually he had donated over 5,000 acres of land. Because Moran is so big, we have a lot going on here with five lakes, over 40 miles of trails, waterfalls, and my favorite, Mount Constitution, there's a lot going on. Mount Constitution, or the summit, has amazing views of the Northern Cascade Range, Mount Baker, and many of the San Juan Islands in this area. Because Moran's so big, we also have a lot of habitat here. Habitat is where living organisms like plants and animals get their food, water, and shelter. It's where they live. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the temperate rainforest habitat. Temperate rainforest is also known as coastal rainforest because it occurs off the coast, which here on Orcas Island, we have plenty of. When people hear the word rainforest, they often think of the tropical rainforest with monkeys swinging in trees and colorful birds of paradise up above and of hot, humid weather. But here in Washington, our definition of a rainforest is a little different. Temperate rainforest is an area with moderate temperatures, meaning it never gets too hot or too cold, and that receives a lot of precipitation and that is dominated by evergreen trees. When you're trying to decide if you're in an area that you think might be temperate rainforest, there are six ingredients I like to think of and try to find. Rain, moderate temperatures, evergreen trees, epiphytes, nurse logs, and decomposers. Let's start with the first, which is rain. Now I say rain because it's called a rainforest, but a more accurate term would be precipitation, which is water that comes from the sky to the ground and includes rain, snow, sleet, and hail. Temperate rainforests receive a lot less precipitation than tropical rainforests, but instead rely heavily on the fog that you often see that gives that classic Pacific Northwest look and that helps maintain moisture on the ground here. The next is moderate temperatures. 
Here on Orcas Island, we have a very moderate climate, meaning it's never too hot or too cold, usually staying below 80 degrees Fahrenheit and above freezing at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Of course, you may have some cold or hot days here and there, but generally it remains moderate. Next, we have evergreen trees. Evergreen trees are, tr are trees that have leaves or needles that stay green year round and remain on the tree even in the colder months. Two of my favorite evergreen tree species here are the Western Red Cedar and the Douglas Fir. I love these species so much because of how old they can get and the stories they can tell. Some of these trees would tell you stories of this area way before it was a state park and I think that's pretty cool. Fourth, we have epiphytes. Epiphytes are plants that grow on other plants without harming them and they don't need to have their roots in the ground. This includes ferns, moss, and lichen. Some of these plants can even take in water in the form of fog through their leaves and makes them the perfect temperate rainforest dweller. Fifth, we have nurse logs. Nurse logs are fallen trees that have act as a nursery for seedlings, baby plants, by releasing their nutrients as they decompose. As you can see behind me, I have a perfect example of a nurse log. You can see ferns as well as younger seedling trees and lots of other plants utilizing this log. See, they work together because the seedlings put their roots deep into the log and help break it down quicker. This is one of the reasons that temperate rainforests decompose much quicker than other habitat. And our last ingredient, the decomposers also help with this process. Decomposers of the temperate rainforest include mushrooms and other fungi, worms, insects, and my personal favorite, the banana slug. This, these decomposers work extra hard to make sure that the soil here is nutrient dense and rich. They eat up all of that decaying and waste material and then create beautiful soil for the plants to have here. When I'm thinking of the temperate rainforest, I like to imagine it as three different layers. The top layer is the canopy. And this is where these evergreen trees fight for sunlight way up in the sky. And you, if you're here in Moran, you better keep an eye out or your ear out for bald eagles because they love to be up in that canopy. The middle layer is the understory. The understory is where the shorter trees, as well as songbirds, insects, and mammals like the Douglas squirrel like to hang out. A tip I learned here is that when you see sunlight poking through the understory, you can almost always find the tree that fell and left that hole in the sunlight. Pretty cool, right? And the last layer is the forest floor. This layer is dominated by those epiphytes I mentioned earlier. And it's what creates that beautiful carpet of green as you're walking through the temperate rainforest. Additionally, decomposers live in this layer and help make that nutrient rich, dense soil. As now that we know a little more about the temperate rainforest, let's talk about the adaptations the temperate rainforest critters, plants and animals have so that they can live here. First, let's start by defining what an adaptation is. An adaptation is a behavioral or physical trait a plant or animal or any living organism has to make it better suited to its environment. When thinking of adaptations, it's important to also think of how our five senses can be adapted. The five senses are sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. When thinking of how animals can adapt these, think of how animals with really big ears can hear super well, or how animals with a great sense of smell can smell their food from really far distances. We use our senses in nature too. Imagine you're here with me now. What do you think you would see, hear, smell, taste, or touch? I hear the sound of a gentle creek bubbling behind me, I can see songbirds darting in and out from the trees, and I can feel how soft the moss is beneath my feet. Just like us, animals use their senses in nature to help them survive. Let's take a look at some really good adaptations in birds. First, we'll start with the mallard duck. The mallard duck is a very well-adapted bird. As you can see, we're gonna talk about these webbed feet. Now these feet are really well adapted to the aquatic, aquatic environments that they love to hang out in. If you're ever walking on the Cascade Lake Trail, 
I promise you, you'll probably see a mallard duck hanging out there. To think about what it's like to be a duck foot, let's use our hand. So we have fingers just like they have toes, but imagine a duck's foot was like your hand that didn't have those webs. When you move through the water or the air, you can feel that air or water would go through your fingers and you wouldn't move as fast. Now imagine if your fingers were closed like this and you had just webs between your fingers, you'd move a lot more air or water and move a lot more quickly. It's also good to think about an adaptation in the mallard duck with their feathers. Ducks and all birds have layers to their feathers that help them stay waterproof and also warm. Think of it like you were going out hiking on a cold, wet, rainy day. You would have a raincoat on the outside and a nice warm fleece on the inside. And ducks feathers have this same concept. Those oily outside feathers we see on a duck are like a raincoat. And those feathers we don't see, the warm fluffy down is like a fleece. They're adapted to be warm and dry in their environment. Another well-adapted bird is the great horned owl. The great horned owl has some killer adaptations with these long talons on their feet. These talons are perfect not only for gripping branches, but also for catching their prey from above. Additionally, great horned owls have these great big eyes and it helps them see at night by picking up as much light as possible, even when it's dark, so they can catch their prey like mice. Now that we have an idea, of adaptations and how animals use them. Let's look at some temperate rainforest adaptations. First, let's start with the bald eagle. Now, bald eagles may not be specific to the temperate rainforest, but they do like to hang out here. Eagles like tall trees and bodies of water. So Moran fits that bill. Eagles, as you may know, have some killer eyesight. Have you ever heard the phrase eagle eyes? Well, there's truth to that statement. Bald eagles have adapted amazing eyesight so that they can be way up in the sky and still see prey like fish, small mammals, and birds way up from above. Another well-adapted temperate rainforest habitat is a black-tailed deer. These deer do really well here on Orcas, almost a little too well with how easy it is to see them. Now, these black-tailed deer have adapted a really wide diet meaning that they can eat a lot of things like leaves and twigs and berries and ferns and lichen and a lot of different plants. If you're ever on Orcas Island, you may see piebald deer, which is still a black-tailed deer, but they have these white splotches on their belly and it, and it makes them special because they're not really common in a lot of other areas. Just something to keep an eye out if you're ever here in Moran State Park. Another one of my favorite, um, favorite critters here in Moran State Park is the banana slug. And this banana slug is so well adapted to its temperate rainforest environment. If you looked closely at a banana slug, you would see a nice layer of slime all over its body. And this slime may be gross to us, but it is so important to the banana slug. This slime acts as a protective barrier between predators and the sun. If a banana slug were to dry out, it could actually die. So this slime is a banana slug's best friend. Banana slugs have a lot of other cool adaptations too. As you can see, they're covered in these spots that make them look like bruised bananas the name banana slug. And because of this, they blend in really well with their environment. Our last well-adapted organism to the temperate rainforest is the epiphyte. As I mentioned earlier, these guys are amazingly adapted to the temperate rainforest. They grow as high as they can on other trees so that they don't have to grow that high, but they get sunlight. It's so smart. And one of the reasons they're one of my favorite plants we have here. Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, they've adapted to take water in as fog through their leaves, which is so special. And again, one of the reasons they're my favorite. If you're ever here in the temperate rainforest or in Moran State Park, keep an eye out for nurse logs like this with seedlings growing up out of them, or maybe a bald eagle up in the canopy, or my favorite critter, the banana slug. Thank you all for listening. And now I'm gonna send it over to my friend, Rachel at Obstruction Pass State Park. How's the beach life? Hi, 
Deanna. Thanks for asking. The beach life is actually pretty cold today, but thankfully it's really sunny out, so it's not too bad. Like Deanna said, my name is Rachel. I use she, her pronouns, and I am also an AmeriCorps interpretive naturalist serving at Moran State Park. AmeriCorps is a government program that places young adults with organizations that need their skills and energy, like a state park. There are hundreds of different AmeriCorps opportunities listed on their website, ranging from things like environmental education positions, like my and Deanna's job, and construction projects helping build homes and other facilities, to working in a food bank, to doing trail improvement projects where you get to work outside with your hands in the dirt, as well as things like tutoring children in schools. I can't recommend AmeriCorps enough for young adults and professionals like myself and Deanna, who are interested in having a unique work and learning experience. For this job here on Orcas Island, I moved all the way from Ohio, over 2,000 miles away to be here. So AmeriCorps is also a really great opportunity if you wanna travel and see a new part of the country. Currently, I'm at Obstruction Pass State Park, which is just a quick 10 minute drive from Moran where Deanna is. And this area is the traditional land of many early Coast Salish tribes, primarily the Lummi people who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. I encourage you all to learn about whose land you live and recreate on to help better understand the environment that we all love and enjoy. Obstruction Pass State Park is a lot smaller than Moran at just 76 acres compared to Moran's over 5,000 acres. That means that Obstruction Pass is just 1.5% the size of Moran. But even though it's small, there's still a lot of really exciting things happening here at the coast. The rangers at Moran also help take care of Obstruction Pass, which means that Deanna and I get to come out here on behalf of Moran as well, which I don't think either of us are too bummed about when it's a gorgeous day like today. Obstruction Pass gets its name from an island here just off the coast called Obstruction Island. And a pass is just the area in between two pieces of land. So Obstruction Pass is a reference to the channels of water that flow in and out of the islands around here. Obstruction Pass State Park is the only place on Orcas Island with over one mile of public shoreline. And we would love for you all to come and visit sometime. Because I'm sure that most of you aren't standing right next to a windy beach like I am, let's do a quick activity to help set the scene. I want everybody to take a big breath in and let it out. Keep taking nice, calm, slow breaths throughout this exercise while we visualize what it would be like to be at the beach. You can even close your eyes if it'll help you relax some more. Notice how calm your body starts to feel when you're breathing slowly and deeply like this. If you have your eyes open, you can focus on what it looks like here at Obstruction Pass. And if you have your eyes closed, you can picture any beach you want, either one that you've been to before on a trip or maybe one that you've seen on TV or in a movie. Think about what you might hear and what you might smell if you were at the beach like I am. As I take a big breath in, I can smell the fresh, brisk, salty sea air that's coming up off of the coast. I hear the wind whipping around me and the wind is also creating these waves that are gently crashing against the rocky shore beside me. Every so often a gull flies by and it calls out to a friend with a loud, piercing call. Can't you almost just smell that salty sea air and hear the waves yourself? Imagine that the sun is shining on you wherever you are, and that sun is creating a warmth on your skin that's radiating all throughout your body. Take one final breath in and let it out. And if you have your eyes shut, go ahead and open them to join me back here at Obstruction Pass. Let's focus on what it looks like where the water meets the land beside me. This is the coast, and that's anywhere that the land and the water meet, usually where the land meets an ocean. Those of us that live in Washington are facing the west coast of the United States, and the west coast meets the Pacific Ocean, which is the largest and the deepest ocean in the world. The Pacific Ocean hits not only the coast of Washington, 
right along the main part of the United States, but also hundreds of islands that are right off the coast of Washington, as well as 10,000 rivers and streams that flow from Washington and empty out into the Pacific Ocean. We call this area where the ocean and the rivers and the streams meet all around the hundreds of islands, Puget Sound. And Puget Sound is the second largest estuary in the United States. An estuary is an ecosystem where saltwater from the ocean mixes with fresh water from the land. And estuaries are really important ecosystems for all sorts of plants and wildlife. An ecosystem is just an area where all living and non-living things form a community. So here at Obstruction Pass, there's all sorts of plants, animals, the landscape, and the weather that are all a part of the thriving community here. Just a couple minutes ago, there was a harbor seal swimming by in the water, and there are all sorts of gulls that are flying by. When the bald eagles get tired of staying at Moran State Park, they come over for a beach vacation at Obstruction Pass, and you can almost always see bald eagles exploring the treetops here. These animals are all dependent on the landscape here, and the landscape is things like the dirt and the rocks and the hills, as well as rivers and streams coming off of the islands. Now let's all picture what a river and a stream looks like. Usually the water isn't crystal clear, right? If it's a really big river or a really big stream, we usually can't even see the bottom of it because the water is so cloudy. And that's because rivers and streams are usually full of debris. Debris is things like dirt and plants. So as these rivers and streams flow from Washington and empty out into the Pacific Ocean, they're also emptying out all of those nutrients from the debris in their water. This attracts fish from all over the Pacific Ocean to come to Washington's coast to enjoy the nutrients that the rivers and the streams brought in. And a lot of fish in the water attracts a lot of birds and a lot of mammals that like to come and eat those fish, which means that Puget Sound is a thriving biodiverse ecosystem. Biodiversity just means a lot of species that live there. So a high amount of biodiversity means that there's a lot of different plants and animals in an area. And Puget Sound is the perfect example of a highly biodiverse ecosystem. Biodiversity is also a sign of a healthy, balanced ecosystem because it means a lot of different roles in the ecosystem are filled and there's a lot of spaces for lots of different life forms to live there. Here at OP, we are a great example of a thriving biodiverse ecosystem. With all of the animals that I mentioned, as well as the forest animals from Moran coming over for a visit, like those Douglas squirrels and like the bald eagles that explore in all of the treetops here. And people that live all along the coast of Washington tend to feel a strong connection to Puget Sound and to these thriving ecosystems. But even if you don't live near Puget Sound, or live near any coast in Washington, I can bet that you can still find some sort of connection to the coast. So let's think together. Have you ever eaten any kind of fish or shellfish that was caught in the water? Or have you ever been out a boat or maybe on one of Washington's big ferries to visit one of these islands? Have you ever just been to the beach or any kind of coast on a trip? And maybe you've taken a nice stroll along the water or gone fishing or crabbing. And while you were there, maybe you saw some wildlife, like when I was having a fun time watching the harbor seal swimming around a little bit ago. We rely on coastal ecosystems to provide us with all sorts of things like food, recreation, transportation, and even some of our weather. Maybe the most obvious and definitely the tastiest reason that we depend on coastal ecosystems is to get food. Washington is famous for its fresh seafood like salmon, tuna and trout and all sorts of shellfish like oysters, scallops, prawns, mussels and clams. People come from all over the country to Washington to enjoy this freshly caught seafood. And if you live here, regardless of where you are in the state, you can still enjoy this freshly caught seafood right from our very own coast. And if you've ever gone fishing or crabbing yourself, then you've enjoyed these ecosystems in another way, by recreating. Recreation is all of the things that we do for fun. 
So here in Washington, we might do things like go fishing or go crabbing. We might just come to the beach so that we can walk along and take in the landscape. We might go looking for wildlife, like all of the different marine mammals, like whales and seals that live right off of our coasts. And Washington State Parks are a great place to recreate outside and enjoy these ecosystems. If you'd like to visit Obstruction Pass State Park or Moran State Park here on Orcas Island, the best way to get here is by utilizing the coast for another reason for transportation. Washington actually has the biggest ferry system in the country to help people explore the hundreds of islands that are right off of its coast. Orcas Island has its very own ferry terminal for these big boats to visit, as well as all sorts of docks all around the island for other boats that wanna stop on by. And if people are traveling to Orcas Island or to any coastal ecosystem in Washington, they know to bring a rain jacket and rain boots when they come because coastal Washington is famous for its wet, chilly weather. We're part of the area of the country called the Pacific Northwest. And it's the part of the country so influenced by the world's biggest ocean, the Pacific, that we have our own unique weather. This is because the ocean has a lot colder air than the land. So when this cold air from the ocean mixes with the warm air from the land right above the coast, clouds can form and it creates a lot of colder temperatures and a lot of wind. Even though I'm just a couple of minutes from where Deanna is in the forest, it's a lot colder here because I'm standing right next to the ocean. But even though it's a cold and windy day, I wouldn't trade being on this beach for anything else in the world. And a beach is just the area right before the land and the water meet. Beaches can look really different from one another. Here at Obstruction Pass, our beaches are really rocky and we don't really have any sand, but other parts of the country might have soft, white, sandy beaches. And those are the kinds of beaches where you can do things like build sand castles or bury each other in the sand for fun. But even though we don't have any sand here, there's still a lot of fun to be had because these big rocks help to create tide pools. Tide pools are the pockets of water that are trapped in between the rocks as the tide moves out. All beaches have tides, which is the way the water moves up and down the beach over the course of the day. Every beach has a high tide and a low tide. High tide is exactly what it sounds like. It's when the water is further up the beach and you don't have to walk as close to get to the water versus low tide, which is when the water is further down the beach, more of the beach is exposed and you have to walk further to get to the water. We can't do anything to control the tides here on the earth because the tides are actually controlled by the moon. Objects floating in space have gravity, which is an invisible force that pulls on objects. The earth has its own gravity, which is why if we jump up, we come straight back down instead of floating off into space. Or if I drop something right now, it falls straight to the ground because the Earth's gravity keeps us tethered here. The moon has its own gravity, but since the moon is a lot smaller than the Earth, its gravity is a lot weaker than ours. So we don't really notice much of a difference from the moon's gravity, but we can see the effect that it has on the Earth by noticing the tides. As the Earth turns and the moon orbits around the Earth, its gravity affects large bodies of water like the ocean or like really big lakes. So right now at Obstruction Pass, we're experiencing low tide. More of the beach is exposed and you can see all of these rocks and there are tide pools down there. But as the day goes on and as the Earth turns and the moon moves across the sky, all of that will change because the moon's gravitational pull will get stronger and the water will move back up to high tide and all of the beach behind me will be covered by the ocean. Beaches can have different levels of high tide and low tide depending on where they are in the earth, but every beach does have some kind of high tide and low tide. And if you're interested in figuring out what times high tide and low tide are, there are tide predictors online that you can look up to see when the tides are at your favorite beaches. Now the tide pools below me are one of the best parts about visiting Washington's coasts. If you visit a Washington tide pool at low tide, 
you'll probably see all sorts of plants and animals like different types of kelp and algae that are growing on the rocks, as well as animals like sea stars and sea urchins, clams and mussels, and maybe you'll get really lucky and see something like an octopus hanging out inside. Let's talk about one of the most famous residents of Washington tide pools, and it's the ochre sea star. Now these aren't real sea stars because you would never want to pick up real sea stars like this, but they're fake sea stars and they look just like the real thing, so we're going to go with it. Ochre sea stars are an iconic member of Washington's tide pools, and they're usually bright orange or bright purple, just like this one, and they can even be two or three times as big as this. But ochre sea stars aren't just colorful, they're also really important because in the Pacific Northwest, ochre sea stars are what we call a keystone species. And a keystone species is something that has a really important connection to its ecosystem. And if you were to remove that keystone species, everything else living in the ecosystem would be affected. So think about a stack of Jenga blocks or a house of cards. Keystone species are like the bottom of that structure. If you remove the bottom of that structure, it'll probably come crashing down, right? That's the same thing for keystone species. So sea stars are actually pretty fierce predators, meaning they hunt other animals for their food. So even though they're slow, they'll crawl over to other things like mussels, and then they'll wrap their arms around it. They'll pull the muscle open so that they can eat the insides. Sea stars help to keep mussel populations in balance because too many mussels in an ecosystem is generally a bad thing. Mussels can take over tide pools and they don't leave room for anything else to live or to grow there, which reduces the biodiversity of an ecosystem and means that it's unhealthier than a balanced ecosystem. But these guys aren't quite the top level predators in their ecosystems because birds like gulls like to come and eat the smaller ones and things like otters can eat these guys at any size all day, every day. So if you remove ochre sea stars, the keystone species from their ecosystem, it means that everything will be impacted. The mussels won't have as many predators eating them, which means that they could grow out of control and they could affect the ecosystem for everything else living there. And otters will lose a tasty snack, meaning as well as the birds, meaning that those animals are gonna to have to go and find food somewhere else, further affecting those ecosystems. And one of the best parts about visiting Puget Sound and Washington's coast is being able to see a thriving, healthy, biodiverse ecosystem. Washington has thousands of coasts and hundreds of islands in Puget Sound just waiting for you to come and visit. Washington State Parks have over 50 parks with a saltwater shoreline, and you can see the details of each of our parks on the Washington State Parks website. If you're still watching, Deanna and I wanna thank you for listening to us, and we would be happy to take on some of your questions about coastal ecosystems, temperate rainforests, the parks here on Orcas Island, or what it's like to be an AmeriCorps member as we switch into the question and answer session of our event. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Rachel and Deanna. Um, my first question I think is for Deanna and it is, do you know how old great horned owls get? Ooh, I am not sure on that. I definitely wouldn't call myself a, an owl export, expert, but I, um, any of the questions we can't answer, we'll be happy to kind of post later on Friends of Moran, the social media that we run. So I will look into that. Wonderful, thank you. And we'll post that link in the chat. Um, our next question uh, is, uh, can you camp at Moran and Obstruction Pass State Parks? You can I'll absolutely. Oh, do you wanna take it, Deanna, or I'll go? You, you, you go. Okay. <laughs> you can definitely camp at both Moran and Obstruction Pass State Park. Um, Moran, you can make reservations for our campsites online. There's several different campgrounds across Moran, and we have over a hundred different campsites that you can check out. And Obstruction Pass, since it is a lot smaller, only has nine campsites and they're all primitive and you have to hike into them. So it's about a 0.6 mile hike 
and there's no running water down there. There's just some composting toilets. But if you do come to Obstruction Pass, there's not nearly as many people here and you get to wake up with a view like this. So it is worth it if you're willing to live on the rustic side a little bit. Thank you. Does Moran State Park ever close or is it always open? We'll have Deanna do this one. Yeah, so the park down by um, really like the main part of the park will remain open. And there's lots of lakes here, but in the winter when the mountain, Mount Constitution gets kind of snowy and icy, it's really dangerous to drive up there. So in the winter months, you can expect the mountain to be closed, but there's still plenty of trail and you can always, if you're feeling brave enough, hike up the mountain, just snow driving. Okay, this next question is for both of you. And what are threats to these separate ecosystems? That's a really great question. So coastal ecosystems are actually pretty fragile and they're really impacted by human activities. So Puget Sound and Washington's coast in general are currently experiencing a lot of negative effects from things like a lot of boats out in the water, from people dumping all sorts of chemicals in the waterways, from people taking a lot of fish and putting a lot of trash in the ocean. But thankfully, there's a lot of things that we can do to help our coastal ecosystems. We can do things like pick up trash along the beach. We can make sure that we're not putting a lot of fertilizers and a lot of chemicals on our lawns because all of our water systems in the world are connected. So we want to make sure that we're not putting too many chemicals out in our waterways. And we can also talk to other people about some of the threats facing the ecosystems. And there's, I could do an entire talk just about the threats facing the coast. Um, so I'm sure that we will be able to share kind of some more specific examples about different threats and how you can get involved in helping protect our coasts if you are interested. And I would say for the temperate rainforest, one of, or I mean, there are a lot of threats just like the coast, but of course, deforestation, we really need to protect these habitats and what we have left and so, State parks are a great way to protect that habitat. I would say support your state parks and make sure you know you can protect as much of this temperate rainforest habitat as we have. Additionally, once you're here in the habitat, staying on the trails is really important because when people go off the trail, they can step on these epiphytes, the mosses, ferns, and lichens, and the fungi, and kind of just mess with the ecosystem and the habitat. So my biggest recommendation is to stay on the trail whenever you're in a temperate rainforest or any forest for that matter. I've heard that plants grow by the inch and die by the foot. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, Deanna, the next question is for you. Are banana slugs poisonous? You know, I think <laughs> to the slime on the outside, from what I've heard is quite bitter and that's what protects them from the predators. And so I'm not, I'm not certain it's poisonous, but it is pretty gross. I would not recommend a predator or a human eating or trying to lick a banana slug. I don't think you'll die, but I don't think you or them would enjoy it. So I would not recommend that. Certainly not banana flavored. No, not at all. <laughs> So Rachel, this next question is for you. What other types of birds live at Obstruction Pass State Park other than bald eagles? There are all sorts of gulls that live here um, and they all kind of look the same. They're all white and gray. <laughs> so I can't distinguish between the gulls, but you can get a field guide that'll tell you specifically what kind of gulls are out here. And there are songbirds that live in the forest Songbirds are things that sing and make a song, like robins and wrens and nuthatches and all sorts of fun things like that. Um, and on the island, we also have golden eagles that are, um, they're a little bit bigger than bald eagles and they sometimes compete with bald eagles for this space. So pretty much every day, every time I come to Obstruction Pass, I see bald eagles flying ahead and then I see gold, golden eagles yelling at them as well. Um, so there's I know a lot of cool stuff. And then there's also a lot of coastal birds that come by and walk along the coast here. Like that's a great blue heron that's flying by in the background, but I'm not sure that you can see them. That's awesome. 
So our next question is for both of you. And it says, I'm looking at working with AmeriCorps as I transition careers. Can you tell me how you got involved and what the best part of the program is? I can go first on that. So I graduated from undergraduate this May, 2020, and I was looking for something to do, something fun that would get me out of my home in Maine. And so I stumbled across AmeriCorps from a friend telling me about it. And then I saw that there were positions out in Washington and I was, I feel like most college graduates was looking to get as far away as I could. So I applied and then started working with one of the Rangers here to, you know, interview. And then I was totally sold. So working in a state park has been so much fun getting to know everyone and also just Living and working in one of the most beautiful places I've ever been is definitely one of my favorite parts about it. And for me, um, I, I'm actually halfway through a master's program back home in Ohio. But as I'm sure you all know, last year didn't go like any of us were expecting. And so I was looking at how different school would be for the time being, and I wasn't super excited about it. So I decided that I wanted to take a gap year off and do something fun. So I knew about AmeriCorps because I did a lot of different community service projects in undergrad. And I looked on AmeriCorps website and it's really easy to look through all the different job postings. So I said, I know a lot about the environment and I like being outside. So let me look at all the environmental positions. And I applied to every position that was in a really cool place. So in Washington and Oregon and California, because I just love being outside and that's how I ended up here on Orcas Island. And my favorite part about being here is getting to be outside, getting to go hiking every day and coming to a coastal ecosystem like this. Because where I'm from, it's a lot of flatland and farms. So this has been the most exciting thing ever. And a great thing about AmeriCorps is that they all have a time commitment. So Deanna and I are here for 10 and a half months and then we're moving on. So it's not like I came here and don't know what I'm doing next. I know that I'm going back home and going back to school, but this has been the most amazing gap year and a great way just to work out in the field for a little bit. Sounds like an awesome experience. Rachel, this next question is for you again. What types of invasive species can harm coastal ecosystems? That's a really great question. And it really depends on what kind of coastal ecosystem you're looking at. So the things that we might have growing here in this really temperate, chilly climate are different than what is growing down by the Gulf of Mexico, um, where it's a lot warmer than up here. Uh, I know that here on the island, um, we have an invasive plant called Scottish broom that's been a really big problem. There's actually other AmeriCorps that are serving at Moran State Park, and part of their job is just to be removing Scottish broom. Um, they do a lot of the trail maintenance work and help to build trails here. So if you're interested in doing a lot of hands-on outside work like that, AmeriCorps also has um, many positions where you can come and do that. As far as specific invasive plants that are threatening Washington's coasts, I'm not too familiar with plants. So we'll be able to answer that later on after I can research it a little bit. Can you both tell us more about your favorite animal on the island? I have already talked a lot about mine, the banana slug, but I can keep going. I, this, um, I think the banana slugs are so cool. They're my favorite celebrity to see on the trail. I just find them so interesting when you get down and close and really look at them and watch them go. You can see their little antenna eyes kind of peek in and out. And they're just one of the most fun animals for me to watch. And I also, after doing this Wild Washington lesson plan, have so much respect for them and what they do. They're so good at cleaning up the forest floor. They're so smart in the adaptations they have. They have an amazing sense of smell and even touch with those antenna. I just love and respect them so much. Deanna really does love the banana slugs. When I'm out <laughs> hiking and I see one, I take a picture of one or I FaceTime her so that when she answers the phone, it's just straight banana slug content because they are pretty cool. But my favorite animal here is the black-tailed deer. Since we are an island and a relatively small island, there's only so many individuals 
that the deers can mate with with each other. So the deer on this island specifically over time have become really small and they're about half the size of deer that you would see back on the mainland, even other species of deer. So all of the deer on the island kind of look like baby deer here. And even the males, when they grow their antlers, they just grow these tiny little stubby antlers. So it just looks like there's a bunch of baby deer walking everywhere and they're really cute. And so that's my favorite part because you see them every single day here because there's so many deer. That sounds pretty cute. What is the best time to visit either Moran or Obstruction Pass? I think it really depends on what kind of experience you're looking for. So the best weather is going to be in the summertime where the temperatures are in the 60s and the 70s and we have a lot more sunshine. But of course, that's when everyone wants to come here so we can get really, really busy. So if you're interested in camping at Moran State Park this summer, I would recommend making a reservation now because usually in the summer months like May, June, July, August, we're completely full all throughout the park. Visiting in the off season, um, when it's not peak weather conditions, so that would be like October to April pretty much, there's going to be a lot less people in the park, but the weather just might not be as nice. And that goes for both Moran and Obstruction Pass. So it's up to whether you want to have great weather and a lot of people or less people, but taking a gamble with the weather. Yeah, and I would say there really are benefits it's to every season here too because uh, here in Moran like if you come around Thanksgiving you can have the chance to see kokanee salmon trying to swim up the Moran Creek and they're amazing to watch and so it's whenever you come there are fun things to you know see and do but I, I agree with Rachel that you know summer is when things are warm and beautiful and sunny so that's definitely a good season to come. Like Rachel said earlier, pack your raincoat. You should be fine. <laughs> we just have yeah, a couple Yeah, if you more... just be prepared, it'll be good. <laughs> we just have a couple more questions for you. Um, the next one is for you, Rachel. We heard that you called them sea stars, not uh, starfish. How, what is the difference or is there a difference? Um, yeah, so there's not a difference. Um, starfish are just kind of the more common name, but sea stars are kind of like their scientific professional name, if you will. It's like I said gulls. Gulls are the name for the birds. Um, Glaucus wing gull is like a specific type of gull that flies around, but seagulls are the same thing. This next question is for both of you. Do you get to live at a state park? Yes, we actually here at Moran, I'm not, I can't speak for all Washington State Parks and AmeriCorps programs. But here at Moran, yes, we live right down in Camp Moran at the Environmental Learning Center. And it's been such a fun experience to really, you know, wake up and there's a trail here called Sunrise Rock that Rachel and I have started hiking to every single morning because it's just outside of our bedrooms. And so it really is so nice and we do live here. And that's another benefit of AmeriCorps is a lot of the programs will provide housing so both Deanna and I moved from other states to come here and obviously didn't have a place to live, but we're able to live right in the park, which is great because the commute is just the fastest commute that I've ever had. That's awesome. So our last question for both of you is if someone were to be interested in working with either AmeriCorps or Washington State Parks, what experience or skills do you recommend that they have to get started? I would say one skill that I like, well, so I, I have a um, degree in biology. And so I had a lot of background in, you know, ecosystems and habitats and marine. And, you know, I feel like I had the qualifications, but also the most important thing is to just have the excitement and the passion because before doing this I never really had much you know cinematography or film experience but now we've been out creating you know short videos and doing this live event and so it's been really fun to learn a skill that I never thought going into this I would be gaining so I think the most important thing is just 
try to say no as little as possible and just take on these challenges and these risks that you might not even be comfortable with, but you're going to gain experience. And now I feel I know how to edit a video and I didn't before. <laughs> I would agree with Deanna that passion is the main thing that you need to work in this field. I had never worked at a state park or done anything with the Department of Fish and Wildlife before coming out to this job. My background is in animal care. I worked at a zoo and a wildlife hospital before this, but I just love animals and I love being outside. And when the rangers at the park interviewed me for this position, they could feel that passion from me. And that's why they wanted me here because they said, we can teach you all the things that you need to know about working in a park and all of that kind of stuff. But we want someone who's gonna be excited to be here every day. So even if you don't have specific experience, if you're just really excited about it, people will feel that. And my other piece of advice is just to do anything you can that gets you interested in the field that you're passionate about. So any kind of volunteer experience, any kind of museum tour, reach out to people. I, when I was younger, I would meet people at the zoo and I would say, your job sounds so cool. Can I interview you sometime? So when I was a teenager, I would just, talk to people about their jobs so that I could learn and then I was able to pull on that experience once I got older and I actually had to figure out what I wanted to do I had all of these different handfuls of experiences that I could pull from that I had done because I went out and I sought those things out that's wonderful advice thank you both so much for all of your time and energy and and for standing out in the cold and talking to us I learned so much today and this has been so informative. Um, for those still watching, I just wanna let you know the event is uh, has been recorded and it will be available on WDFW's YouTube channel uh, later this week. And our next Wild Washington Live is on April 30th and we'll be in the field again with one of our uh, herpetologists. So a biologist who studies reptiles and amphibians. Thank you so much, Rachel and Deanna. It was great to see you and I, I just loved learning today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us.